Panorama TV presents How They Do That, where we explore the world of professional photographers and share their techniques with you. Here's your host, Mark Wallace. Hi everybody, welcome to this episode of How They Do That. I'm Mark Wallace. Well, on today's episode, we have a photographer that I'm very excited to bring to you. Her name is Michelle Westmoreland. Michelle is a freelance photographer out of Redmond, Washington. She shoots for adventure companies. She shoots yachts and travel and lifestyle and underwater photography. She's been inducted into the Women Divers Hall of Fame. She's won several awards, including Environmental Photography International, Photo District News, and the PNG Underwater Photo Competition. She's been published in the National Geographic. She teaches workshops both locally and overseas. She's just an amazing photographer. And the good news is she is coming to the Adorama Learning Center as a new content provider. So she's gonna be giving you all kinds of tips about underwater photography. In fact, she's partnering with Matt Weiss. And so Matt and Michelle are gonna be bringing you all kinds of information. So without further ado, here is Michelle Westmoreland. So Michelle, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you, Mark. I'm really excited about working with the Adorama Learning Center. Well, I'm really excited for you to be there. In fact, let's talk a little bit more about what you're going to be bringing. Um, you know, I mentioned in the introduction that you're partnering with Matt Weiss. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that partnership is and who Matt is since he isn't here on the show with us today? Yeah, Matt Weiss is a really talented young man in underwater photography and he has DivePhoto.com. He's really, really uh, up to date in all things technical when it comes to uh, product testing and seeing what housings work, what lighting is, is good. And so we're collaborating on this and working in partnership to make sure that we can bring some of the best information to the viewers on Adorama uh, Learning Center. Yeah, it's going to be pretty spectacular. We, uh, on our other show, Digital Photography One-on-One, -on -One, we do get a lot of questions about underwater photography. And I live in a desert, so it's sort of hard for us to talk a little bit about that. So we're really excited that you're going to be partnering with us and, and bringing stuff to the Learning Center. Well, before we talk about underwater photography specifically, let's talk a little bit about um, your photography in general. And you do a lot of resorts and yachts, underwater photography, but also travel and lifestyle photography, as well as something I really want to talk about a little bit later, and that's indigenous cultures. But let's start with the, the resorts and yachts. Uh, how do you get that job? I mean, how did you start with all this travel and, and getting to all these resorts? Well, you know, I find as a photographer, you really need to be diverse, especially if you really want to make a living in this uh, very competitive, competitive environment. And um, I noticed that many of the resorts and live aboard dive boats really did not have strong marketing images. So that's when I began working and taking my talents both as an underwater photographer and as a life lifestyle shooter for many of the stock agencies, combine it and at least bring that kind of um, availability to the property owners and let their marketing images be strong. Well, let me ask you a little bit about the, the gear that you're using on these shoots because it seems like you're traveling a lot uh, and to locations that aren't necessarily easy to get to. So can you tell us a little bit about what you carry with you and, and how you approach these shoots? I'll tell you, the equipment is always on overload. And these days, you know, with the flight restrictions, baggage restrictions, um, it's a challenge because I not only have dive gear, which is mask, fins, snorkels, BCs, all those kind of things. I have to have all my underwater camera equipment, my housings, my lights. And then if I'm doing a boat shoot, I've got to have lights to, for the interiors and all of that. So it is a challenge. It's a lot of equipment. Now, are you shipping this equipment out in advance or are you checking it with you on the planes? Uh, actually, I carry my camera bodies and lenses, some of the uh, key things, my backup hard drive, my computer with me on the plane. Everything else has to get shipped um, in, in the check-in baggage. So with the weight restrictions, I usually go over the weight restrictions of 50 pounds. I mean, that's just uh, uh, not an acceptable amount for a photographer with a very heavy housing and, and that. So. So yes, I wind up paying excess baggage fees, but I need to get the equipment there. Yeah, that's one of the, the joys if you have elite status. You can go up to 70 pounds on some airlines, which is really nice. Um, well, let's talk about the, your approach to lighting because you have very natural looking lighting. Is it actually all natural light? Are you bringing speed lights or strobes? 
specifically when you're shooting you know, the resorts and the hotel rooms and the cabanas and some of the things that we see on your website? You know, it's a combination of things. Um, I love the evening shoots and a lot of the interiors and that. Um, to get that cobalt blue behind, it kind of sets off the interior of like a dining room. Uh, but I generally will use some kind of fill, you know, with the flash using umbrellas or maybe pop my strobes um, just to light up, give a little bit more definition in the corner. So there's a lot of techniques that are used to try and give a balance to that image. Well, let's uh, shift gears a little bit. And we we're talking about your travel specific photography um, and the lifestyle photography in, in contrast to the resorts and yachts. Uh, with travel and lifestyle, you have a lot of uh, people in those images. Are those hired models or are those people that are, uh, just happen to be there? How do you get those people in your images? And then how do you deal with model releases so you can resell those images? Well, Mark, it's A, B, C, D, and all of the above. Um, if I'm doing any commercial shoot whatsoever, there's not a person that's uh, appearing in that image that is not model released. I get a signed model release from everyone. Sometimes it's guests at the, at the resort or on the liveaboard dive boat that are so kind and generous with their time um, to, to work with me on a photo shoot. Uh, sometimes it's my photo assistant Sandy if she happens to be with me. Um, and on occasion I do hire models. Uh, so, but they are all released. Awesome, and that's a question that we get all the time. People don't understand that you have to get model releases if you're gonna resell, and it's true, you gotta do it. Well, speaking of people, there's something that I know you're passionate about, and that are and those are indigenous cultures, and you just have some amazing photos that talk about indigenous cultures. Tell us a little bit about Papua New Guinea and uh, what you shot there and your work with indigenous cultures. Well, I started diving in Papua New Guinea in 1991, and I've just made my 27th trip there. Uh, I have a passion for this country. What I found uh, early on was the marine biodiversity was extraordinary, and I was so captivated by it. But then I started to raise my head above the surface of the water and notice just how incredible and diverse the culture is in Papua New Guinea. And as a conservation photographer, along with you know, being a commercial shooter, uh, I really started to see the connection between the culture you know, and the health of the reefs. So I really started focusing on the people because I really think they have, you have to show that connection between the marine life and the people. Do you find any uh, internal conflicts as a resort photographer and a cons uh, conservation photographer knowing that shooting and promoting resorts and yachts are going to bring people into locations that may or may not damage the, the, uh, you know, the situation that is there. Uh, do you find any conflicts with that or is there a responsible way to promote those uh, resorts while still uh, helping to conserve the, the environment? Mark, that's a very good question. And I generally try and watch who the operators are that I work with. For the most part, these are kind of echo resorts. Uh, live aboard dive boats have strict regulations on mooring, anchoring. Uh, they uh, make sure that the divers are not impacting the reef too much. So I have no problem aligning with, with those type of operators. So, but that is a good question, and I do keep an eye on it. Yeah, I, I think that's important for anybody that's getting into uh, conservation work to really vet who you're working with to make sure that you're not you know, unintentionally promoting something that's actually harmful instead of helpful. Well, some of the, my travels do allow me to see uh, what is happening around the world. I'm very fortunate. I can, sp I can spot uh, real uh, conservation issues and uh, bring that back to report to an organization that I belong to called International League of Conservation Photographers. So I get a bit of um, the commercial work, but I also get some photojournalism thrown in there as well. So Michelle, for those photographers that are interested a little bit more about your conservation work, or maybe for them to get involved, do you have a place that they could uh, learn more? Uh, yes, International League of Conservation Photographers is at ilcp.com. Uh, I do have some work, both commercial and conservation, on my personal website, which is westmorelandimages.com. Well, thank you so much for telling us all about that. It's very important uh, information for everyone to know. Well, let's uh, hop into the heart of what we really want to talk about today, and that is your underwater photography. And so uh, we have a bunch of images that you sent us, and this is just amazing work. 
And I want to ask you, first and foremost, can you tell us a little about the housings that you use and how you protect your, your cameras underwater? Um, how, how do those things work? Well, I use a DSLR camera body, Canon, a 5D Mark II and a 5D. And they are housed in a C-cam aluminum housing, uh, which is an Austrian uh, design. Uh, along with that, I have strobe arms, viewfinders, different dome ports that I use, um, a dome port for fisheye lens or wide angle, and a flat port for uh, 60 macro, 50 macro, uh, 100 macro. And, uh, and then I have dual strobes that I use for the most part. Um, generally, Icolite strobes are, are my strobes of choice. And, uh, you know, I've seen pictures of this rig, and we're showing it here now. It is, it is not a small rig. It is almost as big as you are. Um, is it heavy? And if it is, once you get into the water, is it a little less heavy? Does it have some buoyancy to it? How do you work this thing? It looks unwieldy. It is unwieldy on the surface, and we fold up the arms, uh, and it is quite heavy. But in the water, I have my rig slightly negative, um, so it's, it's kind of like it's just moving a small mini sub around. Uh, I think the toughest parts uh, that come when you're working with uh, a large system in the wide angle are when the strobes are really extended out. Uh, if you have current, if you have reef, you certainly don't want to be bashing and running into the reefs. Uh, so it does have its challenges at times. Well, let me ask you a, a simple question since I'm not an underwater person, but it seems almost impossible to focus your camera underwater uh, because you've got a dive mask, you've got a housing. I don't know how you can even see to know if something's in focus and you can't see the lens to know the distance. How do you focus the camera? Ah, the wonders of autofocus. Um, I, think, I think just about every underwater photographer uses autofocus on, on their systems unless they're getting into more creative things where they're adding diopters, um, really super macro stuff where they may have to, to do some manual focus. But it is a challenge because you may not have a static subject, uh, you have currents, uh, it can be a challenge. Well, and then how do you gauge exposure? Because it seems like you would really have to deal with some uh, auto exposure compensation underwater with a lot of backlight coming in from the surface. Um, you're using strobes, you're trying to balance things. Uh, how do you get around understanding if you even have a proper exposure underwater? Well, you know, those are the kind of things we're going to be talking about on our program on the Learning Center. And um, it, in different situations, calls for different things. I never use auto. Everything is shot on manual. Generally, if I'm shooting a, a blue water, wide angle environment, I'm going to take my, uh, my measurement, my exposure measurement, off of the open blue water and then balance my strobe power based on that. And a lot of times it's just a matter of skill, practice, and understanding and working with your equipment long enough to, to know how to, where to place your strobes, you know, how much power you need, etc., so that you get the balanced image. I'm going to steal that phrase from you. I love it. You didn't say trial and error. You said practice and understanding, and I think that's the best way to put it is practice, 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 and then with that comes some wisdom. Um, but I'm, I love that, how you put that. Um, well, let's talk about the strobes themselves. Um, so to dial those in, are the, the camera is on manual. The strobes are also shot in manual mode? I generally, they do have a TTL function capability on many of the strobes. Again, because of digital and, and the different sensitivities today, I tend to set my strobes on manual. And it depends on you know, the distance uh, from the subject, whether I use a full power or back it off to half power. Sometimes when I'm shooting macro and very close and in tight, I may have to back the power off the strobes uh, uh, a bit. Digital is a little more forgiving, in my opinion, than film days. So that's a luxury. And plus having the availability of seeing what you're shooting on the back of the, uh, of the camera is, is just a lifesaver in many situations. It certainly is. Well, uh, let's talk about pho uh, photographers out there that really want to get into underwater photography but they don't have the budget to get the rig that you have that's, that's very advanced and really nice. Is, are there ways to get into underwater photography that aren't going to cost thousands of dollars? Right. You don't have to mortgage your house to be able to shoot some really uh, compelling underwater photography and have fun with it as well. And that's some of the things that Matt and I are going to be going over. Uh, there's some great point-and-shoot systems out now um, that are reasonably priced. 
to at least get you started, get the feel. I think one of the things that Matt and I both want to point out to anybody in diving, uh, if they're currently diving or getting schooled, is before you pick up a camera, it's really important to become a good diver first. Buoyancy skills, breathing, understanding your computer, it's all very, very important. Awesome. Well, we're almost out of time, but I sent out a tweet this morning and said I was going to be interviewing you and asked people if they had questions. And we got uh, a bunch of people ask basically the same question and they want to know from you, what is it like to be published in National Geographic? Um, you know, I have to really back up. I've, I've had an image for Canon in National Geographic. I've been in National Geographic Traveler and Adventure Magazines. I've been in Smithsonian, uh, uh, widely published around the around the globe so I'm very proud of those uh, recently an American photo story had uh, was talking about water issues and I'm there with some amazing underwater photographers that I'm quite proud to be aligned with so uh, it's it is it is fun it's also a job <laughs> I'm sure it is I mean do you find yourself that you're um does that change you in any way as a photographer or as a professional once you have those credentials? I mean, what happens once you have that first image published in a geographic? I think there is a responsibility um, for the photographers to be conscious of their surroundings, environmental issues. I think there is, you know, there is that responsibility. Um, and to encourage others and and this is what's fun about being involved in the learning center is to take those people who are fascinated by the marine environment and motivate them enough to get out there and give it a try either learn how to dive find out about the marine environment and then start shooting pictures well that's phenomenal and you do that in more ways than just uh, on your website you actually uh, have tours and lectures and workshops can you ask uh, tell us a little bit more about those well I think one of the most fun parts of my job is when I lead a tour, whether it's a land-based tour or a dive tour to focus on underwater photography. Uh, I think it's, it's a lot of fun to see your clients' reactions when they've seen an animal for the first time. You know, maybe it's a weedy scorpion fish in Papua New Guinea, and, which is one of the most coveted you know, marine life animals to photograph or whether it's topside in Africa and you have people who've seen their first baby elephant in the wild. That's a reward to me, is seeing their faces when they get to share and experience those kind of things. And then come home with good pictures. Well, that's phenomenal. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Michelle, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. You bet. Well, that is Michelle Westmoreland. You can see more of her information and her work at westmorelandimages.com. And just go to the Adorama Learning Center because Michelle and Matt are going to be uh, publishing all kinds of information about underwater photography and other photography tutorials at the Adorama Learning Center. So we'll have a lot to learn from Michelle and Matt in the days to come. So thanks so much for joining us on this episode of How They Do That. Remember, if you'd like to see somebody here on How They Do That, you can send your suggestion to me at askmark at adorama.com. Well, thanks again for joining me, and I'll see you again next time. This episode is brought to you by Adorama TV. Visit the Adorama Learning Center where you'll find photography tips and techniques, links to the gear used in this episode, and related videos. For all the latest photography, video, and computer gear, visit adorama.com. And the next time you're in New York City, visit our store located on 18th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue.